Okay. So um, this is a quick reminder that I'm going to do just to 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 make to remind you. Um, so that you see the connection, the formal connection with what we're going to do later. So um, Schrodinger equation uh, tells you, this is, today it's going to be uh, one of the most uh, technical days, but if you find it hard to follow the technique, at least uh, try to, or ask me and You cannot see? It's hard. Uh, why? Because it's yellow? Because it's small? It's small and yellow. Um, OK, I'll make it larger. Um, so as I said, if you are, um, um, if, you, if, you, if you find that the technique is beyond you, Try to hop to the conclusions, and uh, and and okay. So uh, okay, I'll keep this as my own. So uh, uh, for those of you, I think that did physics, uh, the Schrödinger you have the Schrödinger equation is a, a equation for the evolution of a wave function, which is a vector which we denote vectors like this with a bracket notation. And it's uh, an equation that uh, says this. And, um, and where H is the Hamiltonian, for example, uh, OK? And uh, uh, is this okay now? Yes. Okay. And um, so, uh, how do we solve this problem? It's a linear problem. So uh, we first construct a basis of eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and eigenvalues of H. Next, we write our initial condition as a linear combination of uh, these things, which is a, it's a basis, I can do it. And then I know that uh, this equation uh, simply in this basis takes uh, the simple form, this simple form, and so uh, uh, the and in this way, oh sorry, I can I can solve exactly the equation by uh, the fact that I have diagonalized this. So uh, um, those that, um, so, um, okay, so why am I telling you this? We are not going to do quantum this time, but um, many of you, or I suppose all of you who did physics, have studied this in the course, and uh, have studied in particular the notation of brackets uh, where you denote vectors like this, instead of denoting them like this, but it's a usual notation that we use in quantum mechanics, and this, instead of denoting it like this, dagger means that the vector is horizontal instead of being vertical, and the scalar product instead of So what will happen to us is that we will find uh, in our 
in the course of what we're going to do, uh, things that are uh, mm, basically uh, technically the same, or it, although the interpretation is completely different. And I think that it's useful uh, mm, to connect things. And, um, and so again, um, the notation that you find in all but, uh, I think, well, my notes for sure, but I think that Kadanov, Swift did the same, but for historical reasons, this kind of formalism is applied by physicists, but not by mathematical physicists or mathematicians. And so <laughs> what happens is that the same physicist, without realizing, is exposed to two different literatures to do things that in many senses are the same. I told you already this happened uh, before and with the, with the idea of large deviations. Again, here, this is what happens. The, we will see now the stochastic problem, which is not a quantum problem, but uh, usually because you study in your life stochastic problems later after studying quantum, at least unless the courses have changed a lot, it's I think like this in every country. So uh, you study a, ho a whole lot of techniques that you use for elementary quantum mechanics and then you go to stochastics and you change gears because the history of the world is different and then you, you do the same things and with a, because they have been in the hands of a different set of people. So I, I don't like this and so I, I'll try to uh, use as much as possible uh, the notation and the analogy with quantum mechanics also because it is important. So I'll keep them, them here. Now that you know them, you can perhaps recognize them that, uh, but I cannot leave them in the big version because I'm not, I am not going to be able to, to do anything in the blackboard, okay? So, this equation, sorry, in terms of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors becomes trivial and can be solved. And so we can study the evolution of any wave function just by diagonalizing H. Okay, so with this said, let's start with what we're doing. So, we had arrived to two different equations. One is Okay, so when we did the, um, with uh, the noise Markovian and uh, so delta function and proportional to the temperature. So these were the two equations that we did last time and F means uh, uh, it's an optional. Um, sometimes we will want the system to be driven 
by um, forces that perhaps don't derive from a potential. So uh, I say it explicitly here. Okay, sometimes I will omit it and then the system will be in contact with forces that do derive from a potential. Okay, and, um, and what we said was that, um, that, okay, so this one is the uh, one we arrived to first. Remember what was the logic? We did the bath, we got a Langevin equation with memory, then we said, okay, let's imagine that the memory of the noise is very short. Then we arrived at this one. And then at the end, we said, okay, but suppose that um, the, the, the inertia can be neglected and we are overdamped. Then the second derivatives can be neglected and we fall into the overdamped equation. So notice that this one is an equation that happens in phase space. And this one is an equation that happens only in space. So this one, if I want to write it like this first order, like, like in Hamilton's equation, I need to make this happen in the whole space of coordinates and momenta. If I want to eliminate P, then I get a second derivative thing but second derivatives in time we don't like because we don't know how to solve easily the, the equation. So just like when you do Hamilton, this one lives in phase space, this one lives in ordinary space. And now uh, when you are in the corresponding spaces, you start, let's say, from some initial condition and you evolve this thing. Now, the, the point is that uh, this equation is an equation, it's called stochastic because those, the, the two of them, because they have a forcing, let's say, that is a function that is a random function of time, and which is delta correlated, white noise. So if I put this equation, let's say this one in the computer, I have to, um, launch a simulation. Let's take this one as an example. Uh, there is a force, there could be an extra forcing or not, and then I have to generate random numbers uh, and boo, 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 follow the, the thing. Now, uh, uh, when I do this, I'm going to get a trajectory. I can do that and it's okay, but I can do another strategy which is uh, because this is, this is the random that corresponds to the randomness of, of the bath. Uh, I can do this, but I can al also repeat with another realization of noises. In the computer, you do that by changing the seed. And another, and another. And so at the end of the day, for example, at time t, I'm going to have a certain, in my space, a certain distribution of probability. This distribution of probability is considering the ensemble of possible noises. Yeah? And, uh, and so what we're going to do today, which is going to be our, our job today, is okay, now imagine that instead of doing this, I want to understand how does this work? So it's the probability distribution when I do the sampling of all the possible uh, trajectories and then I, 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 I collect my data and then at each time I have a cloud of probability that is expanding. So can I get an equation directly for this one that derives from this one? And these two equations are going to be uh, sort of counterparts of the same phenomenon. Of course, if you're doing here, your space is PQ, and if you're doing here, your space is only Q. Okay? Uh, it, this is, it's PQ here because I don't want a second derivative, so I, 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 I do like when you do Hamilton. Okay? So now you're going to derive the equations that are satisfied by P of Q, and in this case, by P of Q, P, and the time. 
anything you want. Is this okay? Okay, so um, let us, um, one word, and this is um, quite a, a horrible thing, um, that, but I have to tell you this, it's not, it, it's not nice, but um, suppose that you have this equation, look what happens, you have Q dot, which is a velocity, and here there is white noise. Here there are other things. So you see that Q dot uh, has a component that comes from this. This white noise is something that looks like this. At each point, the, it's completely uncorrelated. So you already see that if I would want to take a derivative of this and find the acceleration, it's going to be awful. No? Um, so this equation has problems. This one less so, because here it is the acceleration that has the problem. Thanks to the fact that this has inertia, there is a mass, and so the velocity is well defined, uh, and it's the acceleration whose derivative is problematic. Now, these things bring a set of problems in mathematics. So I'm going to be brief on this, but it's something that you will need to know it's a, not, it's, a, it's a chapter I dislike profoundly of, the, of this subject, but it's inevitable. Um, so imagine you have this equation, let's say without the forcing, and you want to simulate it. So you take intervals of time, t, and so you're going to do like you do in a computer. You, you simulate this to get the next time. Here you take a random number, and here you have to normalize it like this. I have to explain to you this bizarre fact here. So this, you know, when you're solving step by step an equation, you discretize it and you move by steps, no, in the computer. Now, why is it here that I have a delta t to the one half? You see, normally, this is the kind of thing you have. Why do I have a delta t to the one half? So the, 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 when you think of it, the reason for this is that if my delta t is this size, and I'm finding one random number every delta t, I'm picking up a, a random number, and I do it n times, n times delta t, so I have n, let's say m random numbers, no? Eta here, eta here, eta here, eta here, eta here. Now, and of course, m is the true time divided by delta t, yeah, the, the time interval divided by how many times I, now imagine that I take half so that m goes to 2m, okay? Now I'm taking 2m random numbers, but what is the size of, two? so that is a random number, but what is the size of 2m random numbers? When you think of it, it's not twice, but it's the, the intensity of it grows by square root of two, because, uh, you know, when you sum variables, it's the variances, the square of the standard deviation that is added. And when you want to see the typical size, you take the square root of that. So if you have, for example, a, a score that goes between zero and one randomly, and you do it 10 times, your expectation of this, is, so sorry, a score that can be plus one or minus one, and you do it 10 times, it's got the average is zero, but what is the amplitude? Well, the, the trick is you have to do the sum of the squares and then take the square root. So when you make 10 steps at random, 
your typical size is square root of 10 and not 10. And this is because the signs are random. And when you do 100, it's the square root of 100. So the noises add as a square root. And this is the explanation of this fact. But this is very concrete. When you're going to put in your computer this thing, you will choose your delta t. But if you make delta t so small that it, 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 the number of steps is multiplied by 10, then this has to be scaled not with, the, with 10, but with square root of 10. It's a tricky business. Remember it. It's awful. And I will continue a bit more. I, I don't like this part because I think that conceptually it's not especially interesting. But it's something you have to know that it exists because you are going to do, surely most of you, if you're going to do complex systems, you're going to do equations of this kind. Whether you do uh, economics, econophysics, or ecology, or whatever. So you will find this, this problem. On top of it, I tend to say that it's not very important. Uh, you, you will find it that in books, you, it's considered to be more important. OK, so another problem you have is how am I going to discretize? And there is another way of writing this equation, which is taking the intervals in a different way. So I am doing the same in the computer. Here, the V, I'm not going to take it What has changed in this equation is that I have taken things not evaluated before, but before and after in the interval. Uh, this one is not very nice from many points of view. Uh, for a computer program, it's a bit of a disaster because you want to find out this, but you have it all also here, and you have it in a way here. So it's not very nice for making a step-by-step -step computer program. But mathematically, this form has a, a better um, properties. I'm not going to get into the details, but so the words you have to remember and, um, is that this is called the Ito Convention, and this one is called the Stratonovich. I promise you that if you're going to do all sorts of complex system dynamics, you will fall into these two names. Uh, this is just a reminder. It's, I don't think it is com something that is too important um, conceptually. Why, why, why do I think it is not too important conceptually? Because all the problem here comes from having taken the Markovian limit. Remember that we had this memory function that was like this. And then we said, OK, we are going to the limit because we prefer a, a, a Markovian, a local in time thing. And this is going to be delta of t minus t prime. And this is how we got these equations. And this is how we got that eta eta was delta. So this is eta eta of t, eta of t prime of 0. Of t prime, okay? And this is t minus t prime. It all comes from having done this limit. So, Ito Stratonovich, how you normalize the delta t to the minus a half, all of this is a headache that we have gained because we insisted that we wanted a, a, a noise that is local in time that is, has delta correlate, that is white noise. And what happens is that when you do white noise, this function is really horrible because at each point it takes a completely random variable number. Now, I personally think that conceptually this is not so important. Why? Because at least conceptually I can always imagine that I am solving this problem 
with, with a, which is what life is truly about. I mean, all, there is no white noise in life. All noise will have, as uh, Mahesh asked the other day, uh, when you're being crushed by molecules, they take some time to replace themselves. So before the second one comes, there is an interval. That interval is very short, but it's not completely instantaneous. So the noise is not white, ever. But, you know, for certain things, and for every time you use this equation in your life, you use a thousand times this one. So uh, unfortunately, this is life. But, um, okay, so this is a technical problem, but you have to simply be very careful because if you don't discretize correctly, your results are different. So it's a, it's a, let me put it this way, it's not a nice fact of life, this, this problem, but you have to bear it in mind, okay? Yes. So about the ITO convention, um, isn't it dimensionally incorrect, like the two sides of the equation initially has same dimension, and then square root of delta t is multiplying with eta? Yes, but remember that eta eta is a delta, and then the delta, uh, when you rescale it, has the dimensions inside. So at the end of the day, don't worry, uh, it's, there are some dimensions hidden here, which is the correlation time with which you regularize your delta. So, so yes, it's... Um, so the, and the difference between is, in Stratonovich we are taking the midpoint convention. The midpoint convention, yes. The idea is that the same physical situation can be written in Ito or in Stratonovich. Now, if you write an equation in Stratonovich convention, you can transform it to Ito so that the physics is the same. But if you did the wrong thing and you wrote it thinking that you're writing it in one convention and not in the other, you can change your physics. So uh, uh, it's either two things that rep represent the same, but then if you write an equation and the same equation you interpret it a la Ito and a la Stratonovich, then you can have different results. Especially this happens when here there is a multiplicative noise, other st things. But the, the whole point is this, and, and the same happens in, in a lot of domains of physics. You write things that are continuous, like this equation, but they don't have a real meaning in, in a continuous. You need at some point to say, wait, what do I mean by this? I should discretize. And, and this is the recipe to discretize correctly. So, to tell you a personal thing, there is one such thing as Ito calculus. Mr. Ito made an entire calculus out of this and did it properly. And there are experts on this. And I, I swore to myself at some point of my life that I was going to die without learning it. And I'm in a good uh, direction to reach that <laughs> ambition. Uh, one thing, uh, there should be an equal sign in the second uh, equation before square root of delta. Here there is an equal sign, yes. But it doesn't second. really matter. Because second. Ah, okay. Um, is it an equal or is it equal to zero? Um, okay. Doesn't matter because the sign of this is random. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, after telling you this, remember this. Be careful with this. I don't think it is uh, enormously, ah, one, one, one extra comment. Uh, maybe we're going to do, maybe, I'm not sure, um, the distribution of work. Now, work, as I said many times up to here, is force, let's say it's a force, scalar product with velocity. Okay, this is the work, per the power you're doing. No force times velocity is the power you're injecting. Now look what happens. Velocity, I told you here, is a horrible thing. You already see it's a horrible thing here because the velocity is equal to something that might be smooth, but time plus white noise. So white noise is the worst function you can think of. It's just hopping madly from one point to the other. So 
the velocity is has this velocity is like this. And you're multiplying it by force, but then it's a mess because it's a force at the same time or delta t more or delta t less. And you have you run into all of these problems. In here, thanks to inertia, something lovely happens is that acceleration is horrible. But the uh, velocity not so much because the velocity is an integral of, of the acceleration. So uh, the velocity is continuous in this equation and not in this one, thanks to the mass. So this object is horrible for overdamped, but it's okay for uh, when you have a mass. When, when you have the top equation, okay? So you see, something that comes from all these questions, that from having white noise, that seems so terrible, just add a mass and the problem goes away. So uh, this is why, and, and sometimes it is better to leave the mass there and then eventually send it to zero at the very end. So you see, this gives you a measure of how conceptual these stuffs are. But if you read, for example, uh, books of economy, econophysics and economy, I think, too, they start with a very long introduction on this one, very mathematically, on this problem, no? Okay, having said this, let's go back to our, our problem. And of course, if you're going to put stochastic equations into the computer, you have to be very careful with how you discretize. Okay, so now I'm going to, um, so I, as I said, these equations, you can consider them as single trajectory. By single trajectory, I mean for one realization of noise or the distribution. And there is always a back and forth between one thing and the other. One thing I would like to do for you next week is to do a couple of things that have been done recently, quite recently, for single trajectories that are very cute where you really don't work on the average, or better, you work at the same time with the average and with a single trajectory. And this has been one of the um, big uh, developments in the last years, which have thousands of papers. Uh, so, and those we will see next time, uh, next week. Okay, so let me take this one as an example. And I would like to write an equation for the probability distribution now, forgetting about individual trajectories, just considering a sampling of the whole thing. I will use um, a method that is, uh, uh, I think, nice, but there is not the, the one you find in the books. So imagine that this term would be absent and that you only had this in one dimension. By the way, we don't gain anything by doing many dimensions, so most of the time I will work with one. You, what you learn you is okay for. Okay, so what is this? This is just a random walk. You are kicked randomly to the right and to the left. So what would the distribution be in this case? With time, it would be let me get, it would be diffusion equation, no? So that if I consider all the possible trajectories, this is time, at a given time, my distribution is a Gaussian. This is just Okay, so this is, and of course I can solve this, but it's a diffusion equation. 
Okay, uh, sorry. Uh, if, if I'm in one dimension, we are in one di if we are in one dimension, it's simply this. Okay? Now imagine that on the contrary, I had this other equation. without the noise term. So I'm doing separately this case and this case. Okay, the uh, solution to this, uh, of, it's just um, a probability that is being advected by this force field. And uh, this is uh, a standard exercise. In many dimensions, it would be like this. And in one dimension, it would simply be This is the equation when you have a force field, how a probability is carried over by this force field. And in fact, because um, I could, even in a computer, simulate this by switching from one to the other by very small intervals, what the result of the whole evolution is the, is the addition of the two, and this is the equation to which we want to get. In, in many dimensions, changing notations all the time. I'm sorry. Um, can I go back to Q? Sorry, but if not, I'm going, this is going to become... If we allow for a possible get to this point and we were we're going to talk a lot now this equation is alternatively called Fokker Planck which I think is unfair uh, perhaps the correct name would be Smoluchowski but mostly I suppose you're going to uh, see it referred to as Fokker Planck. And this one is the one that is related to this one.
Okay, so I want to pause a little bit and make sure that you understand, if, even if you didn't understand how I got there, but that you understand the meaning of this equation. First of all, we're going to, first of all, this forcing, I have added it. Often it is not there, or sometimes it is the only thing I have and I don't have this one. This depends on your problem. You can be forced uh, by a force that does not derive from a potential or only from a potential or any combination you want, okay? This depends on your problem, okay? So when we're going to do an example of active matter next week, there's going to be only a force that doesn't derive from a potential, okay? Okay, so that's easy. Then the next thing you should see is that there is a temperature here that comes from, remember what we did before. This is the second derivative, is the diffusion term, okay? So you are being driven by this force and at the same time you're diffusing and the measure of this is the temperature. If you send the temperature to zero, for example, and F is zero, this is just a thing that is sliding down the hill with the, with the, with the potential, okay? Uh, what else? Things to notice. There are second derivatives. So in this sense, it, re it resembles a lot um, Schrodinger's equation. However, it doesn't have exactly the same form because it there is a term that has a first derivative, which Schrodinger equation doesn't have. There is another thing that is important comparing it to, to Schrodinger equation, is you see it's a linear equation in P. No, it's nonlinear here, but as a function of P, it's a linear equation. So I should be able to solve it just like I solved the Schrodinger equation if I can develop in eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this thing. So I am going to do now already one thing just to make the analogies uh, a bit stronger. I'm going to call this guy here I put a hat because it's an operator, FP for Fokker Planck, so that just to underline the analogy with the Schrodinger equation. This is a linear operator that is a bit of the flavor of Schrodinger's equation, although, as you see, it has second derivatives, not in the same places, uh, and, not, and, and it has a linear first derivative which Schrodinger doesn't have, okay? Okay, you can, yes. So how did you obtain the equation for the probability from those equations? Can you just tell a bit? Can you how just? How did you obtain the equation for the probability? So uh, what I did is I broke it in two. I, I said, mm -hmm. what would I have if I only had this term? And then I used, I didn't prove to you, but I used the fact that you know that this is ordinary diffusion with a random force, okay? Yeah. Uh, and then this gives you this term. Yeah. And then I forgot this one and did this one, okay? And this is the equation of Q dot equals some force field and I suppose that uh, one knows that this is the simple advection, which is this equation here. But I didn't completely do it in the sense that I didn't do the whole derivation in detail. 
If you want the whole derivation, you can find it in many places. Uh, the references are in my notes, but uh, in general, you, the Risken book is a good place to, to find it. Okay? Uh, at any rate, at this stage, if you take it as half uh, proven, uh, but, but the important thing at this stage is to see, because if I do the whole proof, I'm going to lose you completely. So uh, the, the important point here is to see what this means, okay? What is, what is this equation doing for you, okay? Um, so can I suggest that... Uh Maybe we do a tutorial on this thing. I mean, stochastic differential equation to focus Planck. Uh, I can do it this afternoon at two, 2 p.m. There's an opinion down there at huh? the end of the room. <laughs> end of the room. I just want to say that in, in a diploma course, we have some lectures online that we talk a lot about Ito Stadanovich. They are available. So I, I have six lectures on that online. Yeah, about? Course. Sorry, can you say it again? Stochastic differential equations. Perfect. Ito, Stratonovich, et cetera. And you have the person who did them <laughs> in person. Yes, exactly. So I, I can find which lectures uh, okay. that are online if, you, if it's useful. Uh, of course it's useful. Uh, but it's an equally useful, I think. Uh, uh, if I... Can you send me an email pointing to this? Okay, yeah. so... So then uh, we'll send okay. you uh, an email pointing to these lectures, okay? And we'll keep the order pumps where this weekend. Or maybe, eh? And we'll keep the order pumps where this weekend. <laughs> okay. Okay, excellent. And if there is a, a, a not online tutorial eventually, of course I will participate. Um, except if you want to make me an expert in ETO calculus, which as I explained before, is something I... But, um, yes, um, okay. But, okay, but for the purposes of what we're going to do now, uh, it's going to be all right if you understand perfectly well what this equation does, okay? What it is doing for you. Okay, um, I doubt a little bit the order in which we're going to, okay, I, I will do now, uh, even more briefly, the equation that corresponds to this one. Okay? It's a different equation. So uh, I'm going to write the result and we will discuss two minutes about it. Why am I doing it? Because I want to discuss two minutes about it and because um, it's probable that next week we're going to use that one. So what happens if I want to do this equation now? and study the probability of a cloud, but now instead of having a space where this is only Q, now it will have Q and P. So now my, my equation is a kind of probability cloud that moves in this space of Q and P, okay? So the equation that satisfies is very similar. So this one is for overdamped, and now it's going to look like this but now of Q and P. And instead of having this operator, it's going to have another one. And the equation is going to be, is called the Kramer's equation. And now I have to tell you what HK is, okay? It's, it has the same the identical interpretation, it's just a cloud of probability that is moving this time in P and Q, given by uh, the cloud is constituted by the ensemble of trajectories of this kind. And now the Kramer's operator is uh, even uglier. So I have to say that I'm going to denote H the whole Hamiltonian, the whole classical energy, and it's calligraphic because I don't want to 
you to confuse it with the operator. It's what it is. Um, but the important thing here, again and again and again, is that you understand what this thing is doing. So I let you finish, and then we comment about the different terms of this equation, which are, have a nice interpretation. Sorry, the last term is minus the derivative with respect to pi of fi of q, isn't this You zero? could put it here, yes, I agree. Eh? You could commute it if you want. No, yes, but this is applied to... Ah, okay. Okay, uh, sorry, if you want me okay. to... So, let me move once again my formula. H is p square over 2 plus v. And here, if you prefer to be more clear, you can put it here, okay? I just commuted them. Okay, it is a linear operator. It contains derivatives, some of them second derivatives, some of them first derivatives, just like the Smoluchowski, Fokker, Planck one. Uh, and now let us discuss a little bit the different terms. First of all, the temperature in red is here. And always, as you would expect, the temperature is together with a second derivative because it's a diffusion term. It's the only diffusion term in this equation. So the fact that you have a bath is said there. Okay, and then this term, for those of you who have studied classical mechanics, you should recognize it. This term is a Poisson bracket. By definition. This is the Poisson bracket of U acting on whatever it is acting. And uh, it, this is telling you that this term is your evolution given by Newton's equation, Hamilton's equation. Sorry? Sorry? Yeah, the, this is the evolution of Hamilton or Newton or Liouville or whatever. 
Together with the cities, is uh, if, gamma, if there is no dissipation, there is no force, then that's the Hamilton. This is Hamilton. Yeah. It's a clever way of writing Hamilton, a la Liouville, in the sense that, uh, sorry, the passage from a trajectory to a cloud that is moving in phase space is also possible in Hamilton's equation. You do this, and then it acts on a cloud P of initial points, the famous ink uh, blot I'm telling you all the time that distorts, and it's ruled in the pure classical case by this equation. Then, to make, uh, take advantage of Matteo's remark, here, this is the bath. And notice that it's, and this is not a coincidence, very similar to this equation, but only that it's acting on the P's. But you see that it has a form that is very similar to this one which is okay. If this term is absent, there is no diffusion, no friction, and you're, you have what you have. And finally, this term, which could be there or not, is the forcing. The only thing that makes it forcing uh, is the fact that I'm saying that perhaps the force doesn't derive from a potential. Give you, we'll give you a special microphone. <laughs> mm, it's good, it's good. Don't make him feel ashamed. So no, why isn't there a diffusion term with a special coordinate? Okay, because I decided unilaterally and arbitrarily that my noise is going to act on, the, on this equation. Could I have put some noise here too? Yes. Yes, but people don't do it because usually you don't expect a bath to talk directly to the velocity. You would expect it to talk to the coordinates like a potential, no? But you could have put the noise here, also some noise here in this equation, and then you would have diffusion in both. Of course, you do, you do not have to, uh, you have to go back, remember, ah, sorry, and where does this, where, di, where was this, bias, arbitrary bias, where was it born? That remember the equation we did, the, the exercise we did the other day? So I'm going to erase here. It's a nice question. Uh, remember that there was an interaction term when we had the bath and the oscillators, and I decided to do Q, which was the coordinate of my system, and then I, here I did sum over ci xi. And these were bath coordinates. And there was a term like this, which was the interaction between system and bath. Here already I chose, because I could have added for the same price and even I could have added, for example, uh, p other ci's or even pi, pi i's here. I didn't do this, but I could have done it. And if I do everything, redo the whole thing, I will get a term that will couple to the p. And then at the end of the day, it will become a noise that will be here. And this is perfect, perfectly legitimate. Uh, I don't know, maybe Edgar or Matteo know, of any place where this is explicitly done, but it could very easily be done. Um, can we get Fokker Planck uh, operator from this Kramer's operator? Ha! That's a nasty question. Um, yes, uh, but it's a mess. Okay. Um, okay, that's a delicate and, and, and very um, delicate question. Because Remember that I said, remember how we got here? We, we said, okay, let me try the case where the mass goes to zero 
the mass, you can put it here if you want. And then, uh, boom, boom, I, 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 I throw away a second derivative and land up here. Okay? Remember, it was very easy uh, last time. From here to here, easy. Now, your question is, how do I go from here to here? Or let's say, from here to here. No? It's the same thing. I'm changing operators. And so <laughs> this is a, usually a very difficult problem that we face a lot in physics and in maths. It's the case where you are neglecting a derivative because it's the acceleration here that you are neglecting. Now, neglecting a derivative is a nasty thing because you can neglect a term, but if you neglect a derivative, how do you know that it's small? So in our case, what we neglected is mass times the second derivative with respect to time of the position. And we said, this is small, I throw it away. But do I have a right to do that? Well, more or less, because imagine that this function changes very fast in time. Then, even though this is small, <clears throat> this can be very big. So, neglecting derivatives is a tricky business always. Uh, okay, so that's one consideration. But I, I think the, the idea is that you can neglect it when you look at long times, right? So, you can neglect it when you look at long times, but you can also, I mean, if you, you have if you to really check scale time to look yeah, at it. Or you have to check a posteriori when you solve your new equation that the new equation doesn't have a variation that is fast because then it feeds back into your original problem. So to be, uh, you will find in RISCAN this thing done. And let me tell you how it goes. It's complicated and tricky. If you want to do it at the level of operator, you should be able, of course, you, your question is good. Uh, if, if there is any justice in this world, you should be able to do it at the level of but what is the problem? The problem is that, first of all, you have to change spaces. Here you have a space made of p's and q's, and you want to get rid of the q's. How do you approximate an equation so that you lose coordinates? OK, let me give you a quick hint of how this is done, because it's worthwhile. Um, you will find it in Risken, well done. So, Imagine uh, this kind of approximation that leads you from here to here uh, in the, uh, well done, is imagine you have a quantum problem now, for those of you. For example, a channel like this with periodic boundary conditions. And uh, this is very narrow, okay? And you want to study the dynamics. So uh, this other, this coordinate, I'm going to call it Q, because for, and this other coordinate, I'm going to call it P. It's a name, okay? How do I use the approximation that this is a very narrow channel? My wave function is a function of P and Q. So I want to lose, I would like to do the approximation that P is super narrow with respect to the length. How do I do it? Well, the way to do it is for every slice, you first solve it as if uh, Q didn't move because you say that P is moving super fast. And then completely solve it, eliminate Q, P, and then this, you get an effective equation for Q for every P. This is, I'm going fast, this is called um, von Oppenheimer approximation. It's an approximation where you say, I have a very fast variable, I completely solve it at each time, and then I carry it over adiabatically. Adiabatically would mean, it's a tricky business, not super difficult, but you have to take some time to read it. And Risken does it essentially for here. So what does that mean? Imagine that the mass is very small. So you cannot neglect the velocity, but what you can say is that the rattling of the velocity is very, very fast with respect to the motion of Q. 
And so you do born Oppenheimer analogous to this one in the sense that you solve the, this, this equation, but for given Q and you let P move. And then once you integrate away P, you move along Q and you end up with the other equation. For those of you who are interested, uh, look for it in Riesken, but it's a word of warning that, yes, uh, throwing derivatives in equations is a tricky business. Okay. okay. Everything okay? So now, I think uh, I've sort of made you suffer a bit, so uh, we will continue next week, but we have to say a couple of things that are important. And these, with this, we will finish today. <clears throat> so if not, OK. Well, anyway. The analogy with Schrodinger, we will come back. OK? So um, I leave you as an exercise that uh, if you are not uh, very memorious of uh, how you solve Schrodinger, uh, like this in general, it's the first three pages of quantum mechanics, have a look at it, okay? So that you go back to the bracket notation and so on. Okay, so um, what is the nice thing of these equations? That both have the form dp d time equals some operator, which could be Fokker, Planck, Smolukhovsky, or Kramers. A minus is because I like a minus there, P. Okay? And this is going to make an evolution P of Q and eventually P if it's Kramers and the time. So, what these equations have that is very nice, I think I can. Erase this and this. Okay, what these equations have that is super nice is that uh, if you start from a, um, a distribution, so you, you start in your space with some now initial ink uh, stain, but now there is noise. So the, the, the stain will, will move and if we, let us think two seconds at the case where there is no forcing, okay? So from now, this, what I'm going to say is without forcing. What happens is that the P will evolve and one can show and we will show that it eventually settles into the Gibbs measure. So uh, P of in Kramers, Q, P, T equals infinity is simply the normalization e to the minus beta h of pq, the, this is the ordinary energy function, divided by the normalization. And p of q t, this is for Kramer's problem, and for Fokker-Planck, where we have is simply e to the minus beta v of q over the normalization. Sorry, t equals infinity. So this has the lovely property when f is not there. Eh? This is super, super important. If f is there, okay, this is when this is not there. And this is when this is not there. What happens if there is an F that doesn't derive from a potential? Well, you're on your own. There is no nothing. I mean, you have to solve the equation the brutish way. There's nothing you can do, nothing, really nothing. Uh, there is no general rule for solving for the target distribution. There may be a target, there, there's going to be a target distribution, but 
you have to compute it brutally with you know solving the equations. What about perturbation theory? Or perturbation theory, that's brutal. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, things like perturbation. I mean, you're on your own. It's, uh, you're in the world of physics, no? Perturbation, approximations of various kinds, etc. But an a priori formula like this one or this one, forget it. Then you could ask even more, do, do, is that what I really want, a formula like that for an out of equilibrium problem? Is this really the information I want? I would say not really, but that's another question. Okay, so this is an important thing to bear in mind because all problems, like when you have two temperatures that you are kicking the system out of equilibrium, or when your particles are motorized, like in active matter, they are sort of driven, they, they have their own, uh, uh, they have an F implicitly, they are out of equilibrium, and there is no way that you can, in a close manner, solve for the distribution. Yeah? So uh, to me, the left one, the large time solution of the focal uh dynamic, looks like the Boltzmann distribution, but without the kinetic term. Exactly. But like, how can I make sense of that? Because I mean, the particle is obviously moving. It's <laughs> a tricky business related to the question that he asked before. You have integrated away the velocity, but then when you threw away the mass, and you said it was zero, zero the velocity is infinite all, all the time. Because if you have particles that have zero mass, their velocity. So if you ask the question, what happened with the velocity, uh, the, the, you shouldn't ask that question. <laughs> you see, you have made, in throwing the mass away, you have made a mess. This, Notwithstanding this, this is the equation you will find more often. But with respect to velocities, you have made a real mess. And you pay it, you gain because you have a, a simpler equation than that one that looks really awful. But you pay it because then you have all the Ito Stratonovich mess, which is a, 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 a remembrance of this fact that you, you have been playing dirty. Of course, remember that if I had left the um, kernel uh, of memory as we had it the first day with a generalized Langevin equation, everything would be sweet and, and innocent. But of course the equation is nasty. Okay, let's check it, it's very easy. Let me plug this one in here. Now, let me be a bit more um, precise. So what is this Gibbs measure? It's e to the minus, we are in the Kramers case beta p squared over 2 plus v, okay, this is this, divided by z, but um, you see that already this term will kill this one because this term, you, you, you see it's the Poisson bracket of h with e to the minus beta h, so it's, it's zero or if you want, calculate it explicitly. Apply this to this thing, this thing, and you will see that you get zero. But it's not no coincidence, because this is the Poisson bracket of, of something with respect to itself, okay? And this is normal. The Hamilton equation, this is up to here, pure Newton, of course will leave this uh, thing stationary, because it doesn't do anything to it, it just keeps it. This is, by the way, Liouville's theorem. Okay, if you want to do it explicitly, you just compute this derivative acting on here. So H will come down, and you will have a term dH dQ, and here you have dH dQ, dH dP, and you have exactly the same thing here and here, and they kill each other. Okay, so this is normal. It's, this term, we said, was absent, so let's cancel it and cancel it. And let's cancel the one here so that in our discussion we are clear. Now, this term is more interesting. This is the buff. 
And the bath, the way it is, you see that it kills. It will kill this part of the term because the derivative will kick, kick a p down with a beta that will be canceled by this t and it will have a minus and a beta over m and here you will have the same thing with the opposite sign. So already this term here, you don't even need to take this derivative. This term kills this one and because this is a product, it kills everything. Check it, look at it. Funny, no? Because it's only killing the kinetic part. You can be worried about this, uh, but if you're not, I'm not going to worry you. Okay? Good. So we found out that when H acts on P Boltzmann, it kills it. So the time derivative is zero. So, so the Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution is stationary. Then we will have to discuss if it's the only stationary and we will, dis we will say, we will discover that roughly, unless you do something really nasty, yes. But we have to decide what nasty means. Okay, and now let's look at this one. This one is even easier. So we want to show that this gives you zero. So the way of giving zero is that all this thing applied to P gives zero. But it's much easier than that. Each one of these terms kills this one. You don't even need to take this derivative. Why? Because dV dQ uh, here, uh, where are we? What happened with the Boltzmann? Um, okay, so P in this case is E to the minus beta V. So when you di differentiate one time, a Q will come down here and with a beta that will be killed by this one and with a minus because of the minus. And then dV dQ is the same thing. So this will, this will kill the thing. So already this br little bracket kills the measure and each one of them kill the measure, so it's zero. Okay, so you have proven that the Gibbs distribution is stationary. So now uh, think a bit. What we have discovered is that all the exercise of getting rid of the bath, et cetera, et cetera, that we have been doing for three days, we have ha now we have an ergodic theory. We have a system with noise that we let it go and it goes to equilibrium as, as one likes, okay? If there is no forcing, again, also in this equation, if there is a forcing that doesn't derive from a potential, you're on your own. Even for the simpler case, you have to, there's nothing you can do, which means that you have the things of theoretical physics, perturbations and things like that. But there is no clever thing that you can do like this and get a generic formula like this one, okay? Okay, questions? Even if you didn't follow every step, I hope that you see the strategy. Okay, yeah. Ah, yeah. I think I should have said, perhaps, if you have a forcing term, you're putting energy into the system. Uh, potentially, you can put energy into the system. And, uh, and then you're taking it out with this term, which has friction. Uh, and uh, in those cases, uh, if the potential is reasonably bounding, etc., you can show that you have a stationary distribution. But it has to be shown because sometimes your, if your forcing term is too cruel and it overcomes the frictional term, then you have a problem. I want to go back when you wrote the Statonovich uh, discretization. 
the noise term has to be computed from the next time step. Is there a meaning in there or it's just the definition? No, no, it's all constructed. Stratonovic has an advantage technically that if you do things a la Stratonovic, then you can apply the rules of calculus with a chain rule. It's constructed for that. So for theoretical things, it is more powerful, but in a simulation, it makes your life completely miserable because you need to know what the next step to be able to make the next step. So it's bad, but it, 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 it's, it's, it is, it's a formal thing. Did, did, uh, Edgar, did you give this Ito Stratonovich? Okay. It, it's, it's a subtle thing and it's a nasty thing, but uh, it's life. Yeah. Uh, sorry, you need the. So I don't want to create controversy, but Ito, on the other hand, has also some advantages for calculating averages. Yeah. Uh, in the sense of. Yeah. He, you can find this in the lectures that. Yeah. Stadonovich is better to. If you want to do calculations like derivatives, because as yeah. Jorge is explaining, you can use the standard rules of of uh, calculus. In ITO, no, you have to, you cannot do a derivative with a chain rule, for example. But it's, I, I would say it's not that much you have to add. It's one extra term uh, in the derivatives. But it has the advantage of averages. Uh, to compute averages, ITO is very convenient. And if you want details, I can explain you briefly. And uh, uh, let me add in, in um, when you do things with party integrals and such, we always use ITO. I, I have never seen. But it, it is a subtle problem. And, and um, I think that the, the, the thing is that uh, the risk is that the trees don't let you see the, the, the forest. Uh, because it, it, when you face this ito Statonovich question, it's rough, and, 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 and for a moment you forget what you were doing. So this is why I, I insisted a lot. OK. OK, so thanks, uh, Jorge. So we reconvene at uh, 11 in, in the computer lab. Okay.